on this episode of Bondi Vet. He says something about they've just got a new pet and it's really sick, he's really concerned and worried. Audrey and Alison respond to a late night SOS for a surprising patient. A rat! A rat. A rat. You weren't expecting a rat tonight. Hello, Marcus. Hi, Gina, look at this guy. What a handsome Hi. fellow, isn't he? Will this abandoned dog lose yet another leg? He has not got a home anymore, he's lost a leg, and now we see this lump on his leg. I mean, how much bad luck can one dog have? So she gets a head yeah, in there right, and right, then steals it. And Chris treats a goat with a deadly bread addiction. It may sound almost funny, but it can have quite fatal consequences. Come on, there's your girl. In Brisbane, Audrey and Alison's mobile vet business means they're on call 24-7. So Cody just called and he was really frantic, really upset. Tonight they've had an urgent distress call from one of their regular clients. He said something about they've just got a new pet and it's really sick, he's really concerned and worried. So it sounds quite urgent. Uh, have you got the keys? Yeah. So it's really important whenever we get these emergency calls to try and get as much information as we can. But sometimes they're so frantic we can only get bits of information. So we don't really know what we're going to, but it sounds urgent. Hello, Hello. Brody, how are you? Okay, where is this patient? This is Roddy the rat. A, a rat. rat? The rat. A rat. We didn't know it was rat. You got a rat. <laughs> a rat. Partners Cody and Jake are brand new rat dads. They've only had Roddy for two weeks. We are shocked to see that we're actually dealing with a rat, mainly because we were expecting a dog or a cat. Hi, Roddy the rat. You're very friendly. How long you had him for now? So I've had him for about two weeks now. Two weeks. Yeah. And he's only eight weeks old. He's um he's just creeping up on to ten weeks. Ten, ten weeks. What's up with him? So over the past couple of days, he's been sneezing a fair bit. Thought it was cute to start with, but then it kept going. And then the next day it was just sneeze after sneeze and then definitely got a bit worried at that point. Any discharge? I haven't noticed any, uh, yeah. but it's odd to see him not really moving around as yeah. much. He's always jumping up at the cage when yeah. I go up to him normally. So sneezing in a rat can definitely mean something quite serious. It could be a nasty infection, it could be a tumour, or something in the environment that's really affecting their lungs. His breathing is a little bit fast. Yeah, yeah, it's it's and it's quite laboured as well. With rats, they have a very, very delicate lung and airways. Their little tiny cilia, which is kind of like their little filters or the little hairs in their airways, can get really easily damaged with infection. We've got to make sure that everything in the cage is dust free. You can see that we've got good substrate for the bedding, yeah, which is good. great. Let's get him out. Oh God, he's so tiny. Hey, Papa. I can see why you got him. He's that really cute. Very cute. <laughs> like how they hold their food in their front hands, they're cute. You know, and just a little cool friend to have on your shoulder. So the chest sounds clear. Uh, so that I don't hear any crackles or wheezes, any fluid in the chest, but certainly I can hear a lot of turbulence. So when he's breathing, I can hear a lot of turbulence coming from his upper airways. So I think Cody and Jake were absolutely right in feeling a bit panicked and calling us out tonight because obviously these things can turn in a second, especially in such a young rat. Everything is minuscule. Right on this side, I'll just come back to this side. Well, oh, his left nostrils also got more discharge. So we know in rats, with nasal discharge and sneezing, that is indicative of infection, particularly a respiratory infection called mycoplasma. And it is a bacterial infection that they tend to pick up in the pet shop when they're around quite a lot of other rats as well. Roddy urgently needs antibiotics. The twins also want to try him on a nebulizer to help unclog the congestion, which is severely compromising his airways. 
but the girl's usual nebulizer is designed for much bigger patients. In a dog or human, we'll have like a mask that this sort of covers the face and the nose so they can inhale. But it ain't built for a rat. Audrey and Ellison are going to have to do some late night improvisation. We've got some water bottles in this one, but yeah. Okay, let's try. I was very curious to see what they were going to put together for him because he is very small. You don't mind it having rat in it. That's, yeah, that's the main thing. I didn't know a rat could be put on a nebulizer to start with. <laughs> Look at that. A large drink bottle is the perfect rat size for a makeshift chamber. You're willingly going to crawl into a water bottle. Vaporized saline can be pumped in and hopefully help Roddy start to breathe a bit easier. So you see it's like aerolizing the, the saline? After only a few minutes on the nebulizer, Roddy's already more active. All right, you can return him. Oh, let's go over. Oh, one second. <laughs> Off to bed. So we expect an improvement in the next 72 hours. He's got a course of five days to do that nebulization and the antibiotics, but we expect to see improvement every single day. Bye, Roddy. Okay. So you're all sorted. Now that she's met the newest member of the household. So Nix, how's our Tiggs going? Alison is keen to check up on their other pet, Tiggs the cat. How is she dealing with the new addition? Not well. You don't like your rat friend? <laughs> what do you think about your new friend? Tiggs is one of my favourite patients. Alison first met Tiggs when the boys needed advice on how to control the curvaceous kitty's weight. Oh, she's a rescue cat. Everyone talks about it, everyone loves her, so definitely a big part and of people's lives and big is yeah, the key word there. <laughs> come on, get it. Oh, come on, it's right there. We want to make sure that Tiggs loses weight gradually so we don't put too much strain and stress on the liver. And Cody and Jake are trying their hardest oh, and they're getting there slowly. Oh, uh, I just be friends. It's the first time the twins have treated mortal enemies, a cat and a rat in the same household. Has she tried to do anything to him at all? Um, she looks at him. You're just working out your plan, aren't you? She does walk around, she stares at him at times, she does lick her lips. Not a typical relationship that we see every day in consult, but I think over time Tiggs may warm to Roddy. I mean, they're both really calm patients and as long as Cody and Jake manage that and put a barrier between them when they need to, I think they'll get on fine. Today I'm making the drive up to North London to see a wonderful charity called All Dogs Matter. They do really amazing work here in London where they rescue and rehome abandoned dogs. It's run by Ira and her team and today they've asked me to come and visit a really beautiful Labrador who's got some really big problems. Good boy, good boy, he means a good boy. I was expecting this really poorly three-legged dog to come in and the van pulled up outside and we could hear the biggest woof ever followed by the back door opening and Marcus jumping out. We instantly fell in love with Marcus, he's adorable. From the outset, Ira also noticed that the abandoned Marcus had a large lump growing on his leg. We thought that maybe the reason his back leg was missing was he'd had a tumour before, a cancerous lump, and it was removed. So we thought possibly the new lump could also be cancerous. So our thought was, look, this guy is going to be put to sleep if we don't take him in. Let's at least give him a chance. Let's get the lump tested. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello, mates. You must be Marcus. Oh, you're a handsome chap. Oh, thank you. Big smooch. And he seems like in pretty good nick. If anything, yeah, he, he seems like he's been uh, well overwintering quite well. Marcus has been to the school of hard knocks. He has not got a home anymore. He's lost a leg. And now we see this lump on his leg. I mean, how much bad luck can one dog have? I want to be very brave. I'll stick a needle in your arm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, so this is a microscope slide box full of, guess what, microscope slides. <laughs> yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to pop a little needle into that nasty lump. We're going to take some cells. We're going to pop it on a slide. 
I'm gonna send it to some smart people at a lab and they're gonna tell us if we should be worried. How's that sound? Are you worried? No. We'll be waiting with bated breath, hoping that that comes back as benign. Um, and as soon as we get that result, we'll sort of start looking for Marcus's forever home. That's our hope. He's such a special boy. Mm. And we're just hoping and praying for him. It'll be good. An extra kiss for luck. Yes. yes. Yeah, you deserve it. Good boy. Slowly, baby. Come on. You're a good boy. In Richmond, three-legged rescue dog Marcus is heading in to see Scott. Should we go, baby? Come on, slowly. Hello, Nina. Hello. How, How great to see you. Yeah, me too. Hello, Marcus. Hi, Gina, look at this guy. What a handsome hi, fellow, hi. isn't he? Hello. Hi, Say hi to Gina. Me. Oh, lovely kitty. Hey. Yeah. Kara Nina has been helping to look after the Labrador since he was saved by a dog rescue charity. Cuddles are over, mate. Uh, me and Nina need to have a chat, so let's go into the concert room, shall we? Come on, Come on then, big guy. This Even one. though Marcus is very happy, loves his walk, loves being around us. There are a few signs that are a little bit worrying. He drinks a lot of water, he gets tired very quickly. I'm ready for the best, but I'm also a little bit ready for the worst. I'm a little caught out by the result that we've got. Mm -hmm. We found some cells called spindle cells. Right. And spindle cells um, are the starting blocks of a type of tumour. Mm -hmm. um, and the worst case scenario is it can be an incredibly nasty tumour called fibrosarcoma, which can spread to all areas of this dog. Um, Do you think it has spread already or will the cell just be in the tumour? At this stage, I don't know. And do we have a way to find out? We do, absolutely we do. What we need to do is determine if the tumour has spread, where it's spread, and what type of tumour it might be. In this instance, the worst case scenario for a normal dog, you'd remove the leg. Mm -hmm. We don't have that option no, with him. No, we don't. We can't do that, obviously. I know and I can feel already how much of an impact this dog's made on you. So I He's know wonderful, that. Scott. I can't, I don't understand. How can people give up on such a loving dog? I, I don't understand. Today is a very difficult day. I wanted to burst into tears, but I didn't want to show this emotion to Marcus because being so happy in front of me and not knowing what's happening, <laughs> and I don't think it was fair on him, so I did hold on to my emotion and try to keep the happy face. Scott will now take x-rays of Marcus to find out if the cancer has spread. We don't know what's gonna happen. Scott will soon come back with a verdict. No matter what, we will never give up. You need to be full of hope and you need to try. And this is where I think his kindness has paid off because finally, with you, with me, with us, we won't let him down no matter what. That's the damn right way. Mm. This guy. Oh, hello. This handsome fellow is Marcus. Oh, hi, Marcus. Hey, honestly. Oh, my God, look at him. I know you said you were bringing me a new man that I might have fallen in love with, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah? Isn't he gorgeous? Thankfully, he's incredibly oblivious. Aren't you? You just love all the love and attention. Oh, you don't look. care. You don't care. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, just all the rest of us feeling very melancholy. Oh, you're such a soak. Look at you. Hmm? What we need to do is do various x-rays in order to determine if the tumour has spread, where it's spread, and what type of tumour it might be. Whatever God or not you mm -hmm. pray to, let's just pray that this dog is going to be OK. We really need the lights off. That's it. There we go. X-ray. 
With Marcus's foster carer Nina waiting nervously upstairs, Scott and Emma are about to look at the chest x-rays. Is this just normal? Yeah, there's no tumours we need to worry about there. It's all looking pretty healthy. Okay, good. Let's move on to abdominal x-rays then. It's good news so far, with the chest clear of tumours, but they also need to check the spleen, the area that Scott is most worried about. Generally, this type of tumour will spread to the spleen. But so far, so good. That looks like a nice, beautiful, healthy spleen of a beautiful dog. So that's good. So I'll go and give Nina that good news, and then uh, you can get set up for taking the lump off. Will do. There isn't any presence of cancerous lump, so that's really great news, and it does mean that at least at this stage, the cancer hasn't spread. So no uh, tumours I can see, all right. So uh, nothing in the chest, nothing in the abdomen. What I need to do now is to actually move forward to surgery. Okay. And I'm gonna be taking the lump off. Brilliant, oh, I'm so happy. Right. Oh, I'm so happy. It's brilliant, very good news. Thank you okay. so much, right. Scott. My Thank pleasure. you, good luck. Thank you. All the best. But while Nina is feeling more positive, Scott is well aware Marcus is not out of danger yet. This is a rocky road and I don't know where it's gonna go and I only will know once I actually remove the mass. Sizable, I'll give it that. Uh, it's quite a sizable mass, this. It's um, very, very vascular, which means there's a huge amount of blood supply to it. And generally, cancers can be quite greedy. They like lots and lots of blood to grow and do their evil pursuits. Because of Marcus's excessive bleeding, Emma is using an electro cauterizer. The superheated tip of the probe seals the tissues and blood vessels, helping to stop the bleeding. This tumour is a horrific, ugly, nasty looking thing. It's the definition of what you would expect cancer looks like. This thing is stuck firmly to the skin on this side. So to remove it completely is gonna prove very difficult. I know I'm not gonna be able to remove the whole thing. It's impossible, I'd have to take his leg off and that we know is impossible. So I'm just gonna take as much as I can, hit it as hard as I can and hope for the best. Get out. This tumour is a horrific, ugly, nasty looking thing. It's horrible and it's invasive. It's going deep into Marcus's leg. Normally in potential cancerous lumps, you have to remove around three centimetres in all directions. Well, if I take three centimetres in all directions, he loses his leg. But he can't lose his leg because he's already lost one. So I'm just in a very, very difficult situation where all I can do is try and remove as much of the tumour as I possibly can and then just hope like hell that the result comes back, that it's one of the less nasty ones. Really a bit of a half assed job and that, that is not my happy place. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty grim, isn't it? That's absolutely foul. That's disgusting. This does not look nice, so I am concerned about Marcus's future, but I need to hold fire on my concern. I need to be there for Nina through the process. We'll send it off to the lab, and fingers crossed. If Marcus is lucky and the tumour turns out to be a low-grade cancer, the Labrador has a good chance of survival. I mean, I still have hope that we'll get a result, which means that he will live a number okay. of happy years, but we just need to be patient uh, and be prepared for the worst as well. So it's, it's, it's going to be a tough wait. Yeah. Today is a very difficult day, but I have to hold on tight about the fact that no matter what, we will do our best to give him that quality of life. Will it be a month, six months, a year, two years? I have no idea. But during that time, for sure, he will be cared for and never, ever found himself abandoned again. You've got a nice bed waiting for you. And I know someone's going to sleep next to you tonight, and that's going to be me, just to make sure you're OK. Yeah.
Do you like your new friend? Yeah, he's that nice. He's that fun. Oh, little sweet. We need your bandage off. And you'll be fine. Ah, oh, no. It's been three days since Scott removed a nasty lump from the three-legged Labrador. <laughs> Sit. The results have just come back, and tests have revealed that the tumour is a low-grade sarcoma cancer. But while it's malignant, it's not aggressive. There is a big chance that it might regrow in the same area. And if we have to remove the tumour again, then we will do. But the chances of it actually spreading to other parts of his body are really low, and so that's really good news for the future of Marcus. Wow, what a nice ball you've got. Django, come on, come and bring your ball, slowly, slowly. <laughs> and that's not the only good news for Marcus. He's going to stay with Nina and her family for the immediate future. Obviously, we hope for the best and we will see what happens, but for the moment, for sure, he's really happy and he's fine. You are doing very, very well. You're getting better by the day. Chris is making a house call to an unusual patient with a strange addiction. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi, Chris. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Hey, nice Erica. to meet you. Yeah, good to see you. Now, um, a goat. Yes. OK, well, she's over here. Um, but it seems Brownie the goat isn't keen to meet this Brownie from Bondi. Um, there was a goat. There was a goat. Um, I think she's <laughs> eaten it. We're going to have to go and look for her. All right, All right. let's have a look. OK. <laughs> OK. This may be the most unique goat anywhere in the world because right now it's invisible. It's nowhere to be seen. So not her. She's got a pink collar on this morning. I put one on her. Okay. Brownie. On, Brownie girl. was close to death when Erica first found her. The tiny goat was severely malnourished, and the only thing Erica could convince her to eat was Turkish bread. But unfortunately now. She's really obsessed with eating Turkish bread. So we've got a bread addiction? Yes, we have. Got a serious one, I'm afraid. But no goat to go with it? No goat yet. I think in the beginning, because she wasn't eating anything at all, it was the best I could do. Brownie! It was really, really bad. Just skin stretched over bone. That's all she was. Brownie! What concerns me now is that Brownie is a healthy goat and doesn't need to eat Turkish bread. See those low trees? An addiction to eating Turkish bread, it may sound almost funny, but it can have quite fatal consequences. Goats are running everywhere. My worry is that eating more than just, say, a slice of Turkish bread could cause a condition called lactic acidosis. It's also called grain poisoning. And in a lot of animals, it can be fatal. Brownie! That's her. Come on, darling. Finally, Brownie decides to come out of hiding. I know there's strangers here. Come on, sweetheart. Brownie, we've been looking for you. Come on. No bread, but... You know. yeah, no stranger no bread, danger. No stranger danger. Oh, you better follow it me. Come on. In. OK, let's go. Come on, darling. Brownie is now being taken to Erica's house, so Chris can see firsthand how this little goat is managing to feed her deadly addiction. Brownie has definitely become a part of my life. I couldn't live without her. The thought that it could kill her defeats the whole object. And that would be dreadful. Really would. Come on, sweetheart. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go, Brownie. So this is where it all happens? This is where it happens. Turkish bread seems benign enough, but what it is is a really rich source of carbohydrates. And normally animals like goats eat grass, something that takes a lot of work to digest. All the energy in it, all the carbohydrate, is very readily absorbed. The bacteria in their gut starts to process it, and suddenly they multiply because there's so much food. All those bacteria then cause a whole burst of acid to be released into the system, and that acid can kill the goat. Can I see what happens? A breakfast session? Yeah. I've got 10 cats, and they have to all be fed in different places. You've got quite an audience here. Well, this lot, yeah. Got three cats and a goat <laughs> so watching far. your every move. <laughs> she knows where my concentration's gone. She knows she's not supposed to steal out of the fridge where the Turkish bread is, but she waits for her moment. She's at this fridge already. So she's seizing her moment there? Totally. If I say to her, out of the fridge and I close it, she knows that as soon as it's closed, if she gets there immediately, she can still pull it open. 
So she gets her head yeah, in there right, and then right, steals yeah. it. The challenge is going to be making sure she stays out of that fridge because you should still be able to have Turkish I need bread to, yourself. I need to get in the fridge. Yeah, exactly. I like Turkish bread too, believe it or not. Yeah. And you shouldn't have to buy a new fridge, so... Yeah. I'll leave that with you. Okay. And Thank you me. leave this problem with me. Brownie, you're just going to have to behave yourself. <laughs> Brownie's very determined, so I'll be very interested to see what he comes up with. Oh, no. Come on, Brownie. This is more like goat food. And it's right there. It'll work. The way I see it, it's been Brownie's sense of taste that's got her into this mess. Hopefully it'll be her sense of smell that gets her out of it. You gonna be a good girl? I feel dreadful that it could actually kill her. She needs to return to being a goat. Although we'll still love her, that's gotta stop now. Brownie, I had to say it, from one Brownie to another. <laughs> the game is up, my friend. Come on, Browns. It's time to fix this problem once and for all. Now, I considered putting a lock on the fridge. Yeah. Even a latch. Okay. That's going to be annoying for you because you can't just walk over, open uh, the fridge, yeah. get things out. Exactly. And I know when you're feeding all those cats, it's absolute mayhem. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm going to use something that takes away any interest Brownie has in opening the fridge in the first place. Okay. You ready for it? Yeah. It's a vapour rub. Oh, she wouldn't like the sound of that. Exactly. <laughs> what we need to do is just get a fingerful. Right. And we just smear it at her height along the fridge door. That's not so nice, is it, Brownie? And now, I guarantee you... She's not going to go there. She's no longer interested in that fridge. We'll shake it out. <laughs> it doesn't like it. I'm actually blown away. I mean, vapor rub, who would have thought of that? This is so simple, this answer. I don't know why it hasn't been thought of before. The big test is, yeah. with the door just sitting there and the bread is inside. She's going to try and open the door now from the other side because that smells of eucalyptus. So she's hoping that the fridge is going to open this way. Bit of goat optimism. Yeah, yep. well, I think, and um, she's going to work on that. Anything's worth a go. Yeah. This will obviously stop eating the bread and you'll have amazingly clear sinuses for months. Yeah, it'll be great. Thank you. Fantastic. Right. And she won't get any colds. <laughs> thank you. No worries at all. Thanks so much. Okay, take care. All right. Bye. See you soon. Oh, really? That's what you think? Oh, no. Come on, Brownie. That is not gone. No, 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 no. You always no. have to have the last laugh, Come don't on. you? Come on, Brownie. That is not on. You know you're not allowed to do that in the house. Come on. <laughs> I have to go and get a towel. Excuse me. Oh. Cook Islands, full surprises. Hi, I'm Dr. Danny Dusek. If you love our show and want to see more amazing stories from the Bondi Vet team, just hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you for our next video. My next patient's in a box with a food bag over the top. Around here, anything can happen. At the Esther Honey Foundation in the Cook Islands, a mysterious patient is waiting to see Chris. Hello. Hello, Chris. Going? Good. Thanks for waiting in the waiting room. That's all right, Peter. <laughs> go, go on through. OK. I really want to know what's in here. He's heavy. So I hope it doesn't flap all over the place. What, what's, tell me what's in the box, please. A muscovy duck, a large a one. A duck. Yes. Annette is worried about Manny, one of her pet ducks. Oh, hello. You've been hiding in there, have you? Didn't Sneak. expect to have a look in here and see you. No. Manny seems friendly enough, but I'm seeing a big box and I'm seeing a lot of rope. Maybe I haven't quite seen the full Manny picture yet in the zoom. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, now you know why I closed the door. <laughs> kind of making you look a bit foolish right now. <laughs> okay. So you're strong. I know. You never like to admit it, but this duck, he's got my measure. 
He's only small, but he packs one hell of a punch. No, don't start that again. We've already said you're, you're a big, powerful man. You are. I believe you. You don't need to show it off. Okay, so, so this leg. It's this leg, yeah. All right. Is that his normal posture now, where he's leaning to one side? When he stands up, he's leans on one side. When he tries to walk, it's walking sideways. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to feel up from his hip joint right down to his knee and just see if we can work out where this problem's coming from. Despite the show of bravado with Chris, it seems Manny isn't sticking up for himself at home. My gut feeling is that Manny's damaged his leg in a fight with one of the other ducks. When male ducks fight, it can get really brutal, and often the weaker male walks away with some pretty serious injuries. OK, all the bones feel pretty intact there. He does have quite a bit of scar tissue running across the base of this leg here. This is the strange thing. When I feel it, it feels pretty normal. But I do need to see how well he can walk, because if he can't, then he's facing some serious problems. We're now walking the duck. Let's go. Come on. Go on. OK, can you see where that foot goes? So he actually puts the foot out to the side. Yeah. And moves his right leg more underneath him. There's a definite limp there. As soon as I put Manny on the ground, it's clear there is a problem. He really struggles to put any weight on that left leg whatsoever. So you can be sure he's in a lot of pain. Imagine if you had busted your ankle, how you'd walk. So you use your right leg more. With this other one, you keep that foot as straight as possible. And it's exactly what he's doing. So it's something he's been dealing with for a while, but there's a reason why he's still got a problem after all this time. Yeah. I'll go inside and I'll tell you. I can't relax until I've caught him. <laughs> Come on. Go on. Let's go. Let's go. See, I've got you that time. Oh, almost. I'm pretty confident his problem is down here. <laughs> right next to where, where he got me a beauty, by the way. So I think that he's actually got an infection in there. In the fight, it's introduced some bacteria underneath the skin here. Right. And it does actually feel quite hot there. When ducks fight, they scratch. And when they do that, they inject bacteria with their claws underneath the skin. So I think what we need to do is give him some anti-inflammatories and some antibiotics. If we do that, then we'll treat the cause of the problem, but also treat his symptoms. So okay. he'll walk a lot better, but in the long term, we'll be able to fix the problem as well. Okay. That's what we need. Yeah. yeah it is. I'm very glad Chris has treated Manny. I think he bought the antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. Um, the duck will be a lot better and can probably fend for himself. So I can give him his first dose now if you like. This is going to be tricky. Oh, this is going to be tricky, real. Manny will need to be on the prescribed medication for at least a few weeks. After this time, Chris is confident the young bird will make a full recovery. I'm quite sure Manny's going to go home and tell all his mates how he beat up a vet from Bondi. And going on how I look right now, I don't blame him. Oh, thanks, Chris. No worries. Lovely. Good luck. Hey, Timmy, check out what I've just picked up. You're not going to believe this. At the Australian Reptile Park, Bill has turned up with a most unusual creature for Tim to examine. What is it? Wow, look at that. Oh, holy moly. Come and have a look at this, ladies. Do you know what it is? <laughs> it's a little echidna, oh. a puggle. Billy's just come into the office. Tim, come look at this. He's got a baby echidna. I've worked in zoos 17 years. I've only ever seen one before. <laughs> you know what these are up here? That have to be its ears. They're its ears. So because it's in the dirt, they don't have, you know, an opening, but that just catches like a satellite dish. Absolutely adorable. It was the sweetest little thing I've ever seen. I don't think I'd ever come across one of those before. And so when I first saw one, amazing. Are the spines spiky? Well, have a feel. Oh, try, a little bit. Try go the other way. 
Oh, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely crazy seeing it was like nothing I've ever seen before, like out of this world. What's the story, Bill? The machine operator up near Devil Ark is disturbed, obviously, where Mum's burrow is and found a little baby. Burrow's destroyed, there's no chance for it to go back. Oh, it's completely destroyed, So, and Mum's nowhere to be seen, so... OK, they've yeah. done the right thing. Better than leaving him there. Billy says that it was dug up by a machine, so they've destroyed the nursery burrow. Mum's out somewhere, she comes back at irregular intervals, and this little baby's been exposed. Thankfully, it wasn't crushed. It looks good, a bit thin. Face is all clean, no bruising. The baby echidna, or puggle, has had a lucky escape. But without its mother to care for it, Tim realises keeping it alive will be extremely difficult. What do you want to do? Look, I mean, it needs to be hand-reared. Uh, it's about 90 to 100 days old. And remember, this hatches from an egg. Yeah, we're talking to monotreme. So mum lays an egg, incubates the egg, it hatches, small and pink, and now we're looking at something that's a few months old. How does it get its mum's milk then? Well, unbelievably, she has no teeth. She has a memory gland that it pushes its nose against and the milk comes out like we'd sweat and it drinks it. And get this, <laughs> it only eats every five to eight days. Yeah? Oh, wow. Look at the tongue. Oh, so beautiful. Look at it. The first thing that goes through my mind, it's fun, everyone having a look and the excitement, I'm excited. But there's a realisation that he has to be hand-reared. You know, he's lost mum, he's on his own now. There's going to be challenges. So he'll survive without his mum? Could, as long as there's been no, no damage to him, and or him or her. We're in with a fighting chance. We've got to get it to, to start drinking milk, um, get it out of this bucket yeah. and into a home. And, you know, we've got a fighting chance just like anything else. I'm thinking of a name already. Well, we don't know if it's a boy or girl for at least a year. <laughs> but maybe Eddie the Echidna, and if it turns into a girl, we'll go Edwina. Edwina. <laughs> <laughs> Could still be Eddie then. <laughs> Physically, the puggle looks fine. I can't see any bruising, there's no obvious abrasions. I think he's been very lucky. Pop it on here. You watch its mobility. Watch, it, it can't walk. It's not ready for that. It's developing now. He looks like an adorable little baby elephant to me, personally. He just looks a little bit confused. He can't walk properly. He's wobbly. So if this was out from a burrow now, fox, cat, Easy. gone. So it won't need a pouch? No, no, at this age, it's left its mum's pouch and it stays in the burrow. So what I need to do is make somewhere like a burrow that it can bury. Yeah. Keep it at a cool temp where it can just ball up, go into a, a torpid state between feeds, and let's see how he or she is tracking in a few weeks. We've all had a look, fun and games are over. Now I want to get him set up, settled to the right temperature, and start the process of hen rearing. And what are we going to find you for a home, little mate? Hey? You're meant to be in a burrow, not a bucket. I'm in new territory today. I've, I've read and I've learned all about hen rearing echidnas, but never had to do it. Now this looks good for an echidna. What do you think, mate? Hey, Eddie, what do you think? I found the right enclosure for Eddie. It's, it's ventilated, but it's deep, it's dark. Now I need to make the burrow. He needs dirt, bit of sand, and importantly, it must be dry. You wait here, pal. I'm gonna get you some dirt, some sand, make a nice, deep, cool burrow, and I'll be back in a second. Perfect. This dirt's perfect because it's dry. Moisture and humidity can give him a respiratory infection, perhaps pneumonia. So a female echidna, she digs a burrow. And the temperature in that burrow is between 18 and 23 degrees. I'm used to keeping mammals and birds, reptiles at 35 degrees. The challenge is to make an environment that stays cool. This is the perfect start. Dirt, little bit of sand, and he'll have his home. If baby Eddie is to survive, Tim needs to get every element of his new home right. It's my challenge to find the right area that the temperature will stay beneath 23 degrees. That's not easy. Then I've got to have dirt that's dry that he can dig in. I'll perhaps place a towel on top so he feels secure and just try and get him comfortable. There you going, little man. Got you a home. Hey, Kyle. Yeah, what's up, Tim? Come and have a look at this. We've got a home for someone, dry dirt, burrow. 
got to be kept at 20 degrees. What is it? Something you won't have seen. Oh my God, what is that? This is Eddie the Echidna. No way. Kyle walks past and I give him a yell. I know that he hasn't seen a puggle before and when he does, he's blown away. This is amazing. You now see these? This is ears, is it? Um, well, you, you see all the features on these that you wouldn't see on a big prickly adult. No, seen plenty of adults but never seen anything like this. Didn't think in my lifetime I would see a baby echidna. To see one at that size, just there's no words to explain it. The critically important thing for its survival is that this burrow is like the wild. To ensure Eddie doesn't overheat, so Tim will use a thermometer to monitor the pug's new home. So, I'll put one probe in the dirt. I'll put one probe in here. Hey, you see, we're already sitting at about 23 degrees. So I have to find somewhere that can get that down to 21. As well as temperature, Tim will need to keep a watchful eye on Eddie's weight. Can you pop him in there, please? Yep. Just straight down? Yep, straight in. Hey, buddy. OK, we're at 550 grams. Weighing all of our animals, especially orphan wildlife, is critically important. Today, Eddie's weight will set a benchmark. I'll now monitor against that. I don't want him to lose weight. It needs to go up. Let's pop him in there. But temperature remains the critical factor. Do you think he'll burrow straight down if you put it in or try to? I think that he'll probably burrow down a bit, but today's warm, so I, I, I don't think he'll necessarily go down in the dirt. He'll try and stay cool. But look at the challenge, mate. 23 and 22. It's already too hot. Over that, 25 degrees, it can die. I'm happy with the enclosure. The thermometer's working. The dirt's good. Uh, he can burrow in it. But now I want to see if he'll feed. OK, I'm going to get that kangaroo food. Can you do me a favour, please grab a container, syringe, three mil, uh, a fork, and about 100 mil of hot water. 100 mil of hot water. Thank you. The milk that I'm using is an artificial product that's made for marsupials. It's really important if you find wildlife, do not give them cow's milk. They can't process it. There are the right type products, and I've got it. So the process here is the same as a wallaby, wombat, possum. It's when I go to feed him that it changes because there's no bottle. There's no teat, there's no syringe. It's into the palm of the hand. The thing with echidna milk, it's a lot higher in fat. A kangaroo might feed four to six times a day. Eddie will feed every three to five to eight days. So the fat content has to be a lot bigger for him to be able to grow. It's gonna be a challenge to get him to eat. But the bigger challenge right now is that thermometer's still at 23 and 22 degrees. The biggest challenge is to get that down. I've got one place in mind in this whole park where I might be able to do that, and I'm going to go there. All right, good luck with it, Tim. Thanks, mate. I'll let you know if he feeds. There you go, mate. Tim has brought Eddie the baby echidna to stay in his office, where it's cool enough to give the rescued puggle a good chance at survival. You're out and about. I hope that means you're hungry, buddy. Tim is also anxious to get the little puggle feeding. Your belly does look thin. This is a crucial stage for Eddie. I don't know if mum fed him two days ago or eight days ago. And I'm told it's like the flick of a light switch. Either they want to eat or they don't. I hope he does, because it would make me feel better. Now, this is going to be a little different to what you're used to. Here you go, mate. That's the way. Put that tongue out. Echidnas drink from their mum's mammary gland or the skin around. They push against it like this with their beak. And that stimulates the production of milk. And then they lick it up. Hopefully, Eddie plays ball and starts to drink. Stop drinking. Well done, mate. Look, look at the tongue. I have never, ever, ever seen that. See him nosing at it? Pushing down, that's just amazing. He mustn't have been fed for a little while because the reaction here, first feed, he's hungry. Keep going, pal, that's better. Now I can give you some more. I could have accepted if he didn't drink today and thought, well, I'll try again tomorrow, but the fact that he has means we're moving forward. Yeah, mate, more? I can't keep up with you. <laughs> Hello, mate, you're coming up for a breath. 
Eddie still faces a lot of challenges. He's small, he's got to be kept at a really low temperature. He's got to be fed at irregular intervals, very different than what I'm used to. Unreal, mate. You're a superstar. I'd like to think that Eddie's releasable to the wild at some point, back where he came from. That'll be governed by uh, how the next few months go, how he goes on weaning, if he can integrate into an environment and start to look after himself. Fingers crossed. Yeah, you're doing really well. Keep on going.